Okay, well, I actually um, was looking at your LinkedIn profile, um, kind of wanting to know a little bit more about you. And I saw um, this about Sierra Biodiversity Institute. It seems very interesting, um, but there wasn't a lot of information on there. So I kind of want to know what what that was, what or what it is. I, I don't know if it's still around. Uh, it's not. It's something that I created with my father. Okay. And if you, if you go dig way, way back into childhood, um, I was very interested in birds as a f like an 11-year-old. And then I discovered that all of these bird species that used to be here are extinct in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries and accelerating right now. And that really made me sad as a child. And I started breeding rare and endangered birds. Huh? Okay? Like 30 species of them. At all over at the 11? world. Yes. And then, wow. so so there are some people that are just in love with nature. And that's yeah. how I was. I was interested in birds. I would help them out of their little shells and do these things. <laughs> and then I expanded my interest into botany. And I ran a rare plant nursery. And by the time I was 18, I was interested in conservation in sight. Because we had all these programs where we keep things off site, these endangered animals. And you have them in a little nursery or you have them in a, in a botanical garden. But they're extinct in the wild. So I realized the best thing is you keep these things alive in the wild. So I got interested in public land policy. And in the backyard where I grew up, there was a million acres of public land. And it was connected altogether to 20 million acres of public land. That's the Sierra Nevada, this wow. huge, gorgeous thing yeah. in California. So I, over time, I had a lot of funding from out of San Francisco and from, from, from big corporations like, like Hewlett Packard and the Gap Foundation and um, um, uh, Trustful Mutual Understanding. Uh, you know, seven, I'm 17 major grants and awards okay. working in this field on conservation, and I was on the lecture circuit. You asked me why I was at Stanford University. I was lecturing on federal law and policy, and I was lecturing on wow. conservation, and I was lecturing on conservation biology, gra undergraduate and graduate level. So, and I was traveling and meeting people, and I had hundreds of connections in and out of government, academia, all of these people, right? O other organizations. So it's, it's the same thing that we're doing right now. The focus was on conservation, which means wise use, and we were an advocate for actually how to live in the place without causing the extinction of the local plants and animals. That was the purpose of Sierra Biodiversity Institute. Wow. Okay, and I left it when I moved up here because my child got sick and I had to abandon all of that. Oh my goodness. So I was an environmental <laughs> refugee. That is, I left because the air became too contaminated. It's for adults, people, and most animals, they're tough. Their infants are weak. Yeah. Right. And if you get into a bad environment, your infants don't survive. That's what happens. It's terrible. And that that's happens to us, and it's true to plants, and all of that. So I had that, that direct experience of being part of nature. Here we are. We're mm. in Canada. Yeah. Yeah. Did did being was that a big kind of part of you now with uh, Fright Terra? A, a, a huge influence. I mean, the being part of the training, being trained in being trained in um, in biology and also in ecology and in biospherics. This idea that everything is interconnected. This idea that I, I grew up on a farm. Okay, and I had fifty acres. And I was a very hardworking person, and I would have to take care of 50 acres of land. As I got to be a little bit older, I started taking care of the entire county. Then I was taking care of 20 million acres of land, okay? Because I was thinking about it and worried about it. And then I realized that the future of the world depended on the, the dust that came into the air what over Central Asia. That was all interconnected, and I was terrified. That it was all one thing. That the rain patterns that we had in the northern Sierra Nevada were a direct result of emissions into the air from northern China. And vice versa. It's not just that the Chinese are doing something to us. We're doing something to them. So we're all interconnected. So that was that's a visceral thing that you feel in your gut. It's not just a scientific thing. And that's the upshot of this all this work right now with global change and global climate change is that we're all interconnected. And when we're at the end of this, we we'll realize we're all part of a much larger living organism, which is cooperating. This is nation states cooperate. So it doesn't mean it's all not this also not nature fierce and tooth and claw and that aren't spiders eating flies. Absolutely. But there's also a level of cooperation at the biospheric level, which is extraordinary and which will be increasingly understood both scientifically and in public policy. Yeah. It's all interrelated. Yeah. Wow. It's interesting. I, I, I noticed that because you have been involved in, in government, you've um, you know, you're involved with the G7 and and why? I know you you've kind of touched on it that they they both have to work uh they both have to work together regulatory and economically um but which is going to i guess for lack of a better question what why do you go to the business route you you got involved in the conservation even when you were young and now you're going the business route again so it it's not like you switched from from government to this you've always stayed in that private sector it seems okay it's actually if you work 
in and out of government, it's incredibly frustrating to spend years, hire a bunch of scientists, develop this plan, have the plan set on the shelf, there's an election, mm -hmm. it gets thrown away, it just gathers dust. And the, the, the planning is very, very important. Uh, but implementing the plan when the people want to do something else or industry wants to do something else is really difficult. Mm -hmm. You really want to have consensus. And you want to understand, you want to talk with people and understand, well, this is why we think this is important. How can we make this work? Here's our goal. And not just impose on them. Say, mm -hmm. this is what we're going to do. Just sit down now. We're gonna, whether, it you're, whether you're big brother or whether you're a government, right? Also, as a practical matter, governments have been much less powerful recently. Industry really runs the world. Mm -hmm. And that you, can, you, can, you, can, you can think that as, oh, it's a disaster, et cetera. But the f fact of the matter is that's how it is. That's why we're so concerned about big contributions to political parties from major developers and stuff because they have huge power. So if you're going to actually make any effective change, you need to understand who's really in control, who seems to be in control, and who's really in control. And business, international business, is hugely powerful. So they really need to lead if anything meaningful is going to happen. And we, we had that experience in the county where I was part of county planning government, and we had a major landowner who didn't like it. They destroyed everything. They destroyed it got, and got rid of the other people. In the, they just funded the other people, and it was useless because we didn't have buy-in from them because they were afraid. Mm -hmm. And it was totally, retrospectively, it was totally wrong-headed to think that we could, just because the government was thought it was a good idea, that these people could, we didn't have to listen to them. You have to have everyone involved, and then they would have been the biggest advocate if we had got them. Take yeah. the time to make them an advocate. So the key is it's not a matter of coercion at all. It's a matter of saying, here's the problem. What do you think we should do? And really listening to everyone. Yeah. So this is a much better place to work from in industry than anywhere else because we have the ability just to change. Right. Okay? We can just decide to change, and we don't have to. You don't have to sue us or do anything else or impose legislation or tariffs or that stuff on it. We just change because we want to. Yeah. Yeah. Because we think it's the right thing to do, mm -hmm. and it makes us feel good. Right? Did that uh, did that change your uh, though running into that? Uh, did that change the way you approached developing a company like Freight Terror? Running into someone that threw some money behind someone else and and shut it down and gave you all those challenges? Has that did that sort of shape the way that you approach things going forward? It must have. Well, like most people, we set out. Both my wife and I set out. We were trained in a particular thing. We set out. We ended up working in something else. Right. We came up here, we created a software company, the, the consulting work I was doing previously and the grants all dried up. So we created a software company developing international business systems, both for non-government organizations, service organizations, but which are very important. And a, and a lot of very important work uh, is done by big non-government organizations, right? Mm -hmm. Things like the Red Cross, you can think of immediately, right? Why they're there. Um, but also big businesses. Um, they weren't they weren't like multinational corporations. These were businesses that could become very large. Mm -hmm. So the, the, our software company built, the, our underlying team of people then built Freytera, right? Um, so we came into this from business, which was great training because we needed to survive as business people. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about all living on grants or something else. And yes, we ran a business for many years without any investment from the outside. It was only our own money. So we also know how to run it without burning investor money, which is mm -hmm. the other problem in business. They yeah. just survive on massive influxes of capital that they burn, Especially right? Especially because you're sort of, you're kind of, are in that tech sector. We are. Yeah. And we have we are we are uh, funded by angel investors. Mm. That is these are business individual families and business people that have made money and then have sold their business and that are retired and are investing in other businesses, mm -hmm. family offices. And we're just getting the first institutional funding now, but we're really backed by 130 families, which is really different than being backed by some massive corporation or something else. Right, it's yeah. really cool. And they're going to make a fortune when we make a fortune. Yeah. They normally like the venture capitalists would. It's mm -hmm. going to be these teachers, literally. That are backing us. Yeah. yeah. And does that give you more flexibility? Because when you run off things like grants and that, you are definitely, y there. you have to lay out what you're going to do and then there's certain thresholds. But, I mean, you run a business. So you know that you're going one way and then realize, oh, I got I to gotta shift. Does that give you more flexibility with that setup? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And that, that's the fundamental problem with grants. Grants are, the, the chain is very long, but it's still a chain. Mm -hmm. You promise to do a particular thing, and I've run into that exact problem. Where even with a small grant, if you if you don't do exactly what you said you were going to do, you do something that's much more leveraged and much more efficient. They're upset with you, right? Because you said you do this thing. I said that thing was not going to work anymore. It's yeah. changed now. Yeah. I did this, and it was. And I, in one case, I'm talking about turned a five thousand dollar grant into a five hundred thousand dollar program, fully funded by other entities, and they fired me. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't fund me anymore because they said you didn't do this. I said I just turned this into this. They said, you didn't do exactly what you said you were going to do. So, yeah. yeah. So, the actual, that thing happens in You're business, limited. too. You need to actually mm -hmm. have 
you need to actually have a plan, a business plan, and, and, and but you're not necessarily going to follow it because the market's not going to be that way. Things aren't going to work out like you expect. Other opportunities are going to come up. They're going to be much more effective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's real, and everyone in business understands that, right? Yeah. yeah. What's, what's the note, actually, and I was going to try to bring it up. Um, I can't find it. Um, we on the phone yesterday, you talked about your business model versus real versus the real world, and I can't actually remember. If we can't, we'll, we'll move on from it. Um, sort of what you expected Freytera sort of their, their to to facilitate what what it actually ended up facilitating. Do you remember that? What Absolutely, yeah. no, they, we do, and it's actually it's very interesting. So one of the, one of the problems in transportation right now, and it's a huge problem both for uh, for the for the transport companies, is that there are too many small companies that are not coordinated and too many vehicles are empty. So typically a truck is booked 80% of the time, it has to drive all the way back empty. Mm -hmm. Typically with less than truckload, when the trucks are driving down the road, 30% of the trucks on the road are empty. If you could just x-ray them, you'd see they're empty. They're just mm -hmm. repositioning them. They're burning all this fuel, moving all these trailers around. So we thought when we created Freytera that by having a market mechanism, literally by having an ability to discount the price like you do at the last minute for airfare, right, where you can discount it and get on the plane, yep. that there'd be a discounted rate and that carriers would love this so they could fill those empty vehicles and that we would redirect the traffic to the empty vehicles. That was that the initial. Found. Yeah, that's what we thought, for sure. Makes sense. Yeah. No one bought into it, okay? So they didn't do it at all. They were unwilling to discount the rates. And I think that part of it is that, I think it's kind of like the supermarkets that are afraid of what happens when they take the cheese that's being, the next day that's going to be pulled and thrown in the garbage can and put 30% on sale, that people will only buy the discounted cheese. Mm -hmm. See? And they have to, you have to get over that fear to figure out an economic model that works because then it's going to go from instead of getting 70 percent of it you're going to get nothing for it the next day it's going That's into the right. garbage can right yep. okay but you're still afraid so the same rules apply so we found that the carriers were unwilling to discount those but the difference in price between the well-run carriers and the other carriers was so great that we could direct the freight all the time like the we thought oh they like discount it some x percent i won't say the exact amount because it's business secret and then we found they would discount it two to three times more permanently, no sale price, just by using the correct carrier on the correct lane. Oh. So that was a big surprise. And that's the kind of thing you just wouldn't know until you got in there, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so you couldn't you couldn't you do could some market research and get that answer. No, you wouldn't find it until you've talked to other business people and you realize the people running the companies and you realize this is how they work. It's just not scary for them. Those are their rates. There's no change for them. There's no danger in it. They're yeah. just saying, this is what it costs us right. to do this. And like, yeah. that's amazing. You guys are efficient. You have no idea. You're charging 25% as much as that other company. <laughs> right. Okay. And you're making money. They're making money. I said, like, great. Post those rates. So one of the challenges, in a way, you're also, in a way, it's a marketing thing for them is too, because now they, were, they weren't really getting a those other bigger companies or less yes. efficient companies. As long as they get in front of them, you never know. You might yes. have all 10 of the wrong companies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's free marketing for carriers. It's really good this way. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. It's amazing, actually.